So um, both of them, the prayer is actually all you have to do is listen and just receive the vibration of the prayer in your heart. And uh, then after that, the chanting we'll be doing is call and response, which is optional for you. You don't have to sing if you don't want to, but we'll be singing Radhe, Radhe, Radhe. So Radhe is a, it's a divine, it's a name of the divine love form of God in Sanskrit. So we'll say Radhe, 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 Jai, 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 Shri Radhe. Jai means glory too. So during that, you can also just relax and receive the vibration of the chanting in your heart. And if you'd like to, you can respond. You can, after I sing a line, you can sing along if you'd like to. Prapanna Sada Shyama Guru Padar Vindayo Tasya Preranaya Tasya Divya Kasturi tilakam lalat patale vakchasthale kaustubham nasa Karatale Ven Kare Kankanam Sarva Sulalitam Kanthe Chamukta Vali Gopastri Parivishtito Vijayate Patrasya Pute Shayanam Balam Mukundam Manasas Marami Aho Chitramaho Chitram Bande Tat Prema Bandhanam Yad Badham Muktidam Muktam 
ब्रह्म क्रीडा यो ब्रह्मानं विदधाति पूर्वं यो वै वेदांश्च प्रहिणोति तस्मै तत्वं ह देवमात्म बुद्धि प्रकाशं मुमुक्षुर वै शरणमहं प्रपद राधे 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 जय 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 श्री राम
राधे जय 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 श्री राधे 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 जय 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 श्री राधे 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 जय 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 श्री राधे राधे राधे
today, actually for today and the next two sessions, it's a three-part series on the secrets to creating an intimate relationship with God. Someone who's heard me speak before might say, judging by what you've told us, we already have an intimate relationship with God. Why? Well, for one thing, we're a part of God. Can't get much closer than that. There's a word used in the Sanskrit scriptures, anch. Anch means when you're a part of something larger than yourself. So you can think of it like we're a spark of divine energy. So when we are a part of God, we belong to God, it means we automatically already have a very close relationship with Him. In addition to that, Physically speaking, God is never far. In fact, there's no separation between us and God because God resides within our heart, within our soul, and God is giving life to our soul. What could be closer than that? He pervades our very self. So there's literally no separation physically between us and God. We're a part of Him. We belong to Him, and He is our ultimate goal as well. Everybody, you know, wonders what's the meaning of life. Hinduism, or the, the Sanskrit scriptures of India, say it's very, very simple. You want perfect happiness. That's the meaning of life. That's the goal of your life, is to find perfect happiness. And those same scriptures say that that perfect happiness is God. So it means the only thing you want, the very thing you want, is God. So from these three perspectives, we're a part of God. God resides within us and gives life to us and can never be separate from us. And <clears throat> God is our ultimate goal. So it sounds like we already have a pretty deep, pretty intimate relationship with God already. But the thing is, we don't experience it that way in our heart or in our mind because we create distance or we create obstacles. Or we don't do it on purpose, but it's there. 
We have something inside us that prevents us from experiencing our relationship with God, the, the truth of our relationship with God. And one of those things is a little misunderstanding we have about the, the role that God plays in people's lives. And because of this misunderstanding, we actually have some mistrust of God. We're not sure exactly what his motivation is, what his motives are, you know, why he does what he does. We even have a little bit of anger sometimes. We blame God for certain situations. We uh, resent the fact that certain things have happened to us or we've had to suffer certain losses in the world or we resent some situation that we find ourselves in and then we think about God and we say, how could you let this happen to me? If there is a God, why, why would you wish this upon me? So we have mistrust of God, we have blame towards God, we even have anger towards God. And I would say that's a very normal thing that a lot of people experience. But it's based on a misunderstanding or just a lack of understanding of what is the real role that God plays in a soul's life. So let's take up a question. This is a common question when <clears throat> people are feeling a little mistrusting of God. They'll say something like, well, if there's a God, then why would he allow there to be evil in the world? Why is there evil if there's a God? It's a logical question. God is all good, all kind, all caring, also permeates the whole universe. So then how could evil exist? There are many such questions like this which we could speculate on for hours and hours. I could regale you with uh, all kinds of theories, but uh, we don't need that. We can go straight to a really reliable source. These same scriptures I keep uh, referring to, which by name are known as the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Gita, there are many, many of them. But they're a very reliable source for such answers because they're revealed by those who have known God, who do know God. We call them saints or divine personalities. So they have actually attained God and can directly experience God. So they reveal certain facts which are hidden to the rest of us. And that's what we find in those Sanskrit scriptures. So let's understand from these scriptures why evil exists. There's an actual science behind it. You have to understand uh, through a couple of steps. First of all, there are three things that exist. This is what the Vedas say. Bhokta bhogyam preritaran chamatva sarvam proktam trividham they say that there are three things that exist, no fourth thing. So the three things are God, the souls, and the world. Very simple. There's no fourth thing. Try to think of a fourth thing. Whatever you can think of, I would say, well, that's part of the world. It's part of the universe. Or I'd say, no, that's in the category of God. Or no, that's a soul. So you can say three categories of existence. Either it's the supreme divine power, God, the individual souls, us, or what's left, the energy of the universe that we call Maya. Maya is a technical term from our Sanskrit scriptures. It's okay. <laughs> Maya is the word we use for the energy that produced the whole universe. So everything we see is actually made of Maya. And what we're asking is, why does evil exist in this world? Is a soul evil? No. And certainly we know God is not evil. So God is perfect and divine. God is beyond evil. Souls are also said to be beyond the evil of this world. There's no such thing as an evil soul. 
Then where does evil come from? It's a part of the Mayic energy. There's another Vedic verse that says, Ajame kam lohita shukla krishnam vahvi praja srijamanam sarupa ajohye ko jushamano nushete jahatye nam bhukta bhoga majonya. Maya itself is made up of three qualities good, in between and bad or evil. Those also have names. In the Gita, they're referred to in this way. Sattvam rajastam iti guna prakriti sambhava Sattva raj tam Three qualities. So the good quality is called sattva. The in-between quality is called raj. And the bad quality is called tam. The question is, where did these qualities come from? And the answer is, they've always existed. Because the three things that exist, God, the souls, and Maya, they've always existed. No one ever created God. God actually never created any souls, which may surprise some people, but he never had to because the souls have always existed. They're eternal, just like God. If we celebrated a birthday, meaning for your soul, not your body, body, it, that's easy to keep track of. 18 years, 25 years, 40 years, 70 years, whatever it is, it's such a limited number. But our soul, actually, we couldn't celebrate a birthday for our soul. For one, we couldn't count that high because it's unlimited. And for two, our soul was never born because we never began. <laughs> we, we never came from anywhere. We've always been here. So God has always been here. Our soul has always been here. And the Mayic energy has always been in existence. And it makes sense, even in Western scientific thought, that energy cannot be created or destroyed. So if the Mayic energy exists today, it must have existed forever because you can't just create energy out of nowhere. So if Maya has existed forever, the three qualities that it's made up, have, made up of, they've also existed forever. So it means that good and bad, which are two of the Maya qualities, they've existed forever. They're an inherent part of the Maya energy. It's like uh, if this dhoti, if this cloth was made up of thread of three different colors, let's say black thread, red thread, and white thread. The cloth itself is made of those three types of thread. So you can't decide to, uh, you know what, I only like the white thread, let's get rid of the red and black thread. Or I only like the red thread, let's get rid of the white and black thread. Or I only like the black, let's get w rid of the white and the red. You won't have a cloth left. You can't take the, the thread out and still have a cloth. Similarly, the three qualities of Maya, they are the fabric of the Mayic energy. So you can't even say that Maya has three qualities. That's not correct. It's like saying a flower has petals. The petals are the flower. <laughs> Take the petals away, what are you left with? You're not left with a flower anymore. So Maya doesn't have three qualities. It is those three qualities. Sattva, Raj, Tam. So they're built in. They are part of that, or they are that energy. You can say that one energy has three modes, good, normal, and bad. So where did that energy come from? It's always existed. God never created that energy. If he had, then we could complain or blame him. That why, did, why would you create an energy which has bad as well as good quality inborn in it. 
So God, or God's lawyer, <laughs> could say, no, God never created the Mayak energy, so you can't blame him for creating good or bad. They're just an inherent part of the Mayak energy. So since our mind itself is made up of this Mayak energy, see, that's the key. Our soul is divine, so it's actually beyond Mayak energy. It's a divine spark of divinity. But our mind is made of the Mayak energy, just like our body is, just like everything else in this world is. So that's why inherent in every mind are good and bad qualities. That's where they come from. They've always been there. Then it's just a question of which ones we activate or which ones we cultivate. The potential's there. So have good thoughts and you'll develop the good qualities. Do good things, you'll develop the good qualities. Do the opposite and you'll develop the bad qualities. So the good and bad are also eternal. They're eternally within us and then it's up to us what direction we take. So, in that way, we've resolved one question. That, where does evil come from and why did God put evil in this world? Well, God didn't. Evil has always existed. So, before I go on and address a couple of more questions that breed mistrust mm -hmm. for God, mm -hmm. does anyone have any questions based on what I was just sharing with you. You'll have another chance as well to ask questions. But if anything pops in your head, you can ask it now. Yeah, um, you said like um, the souls are, can't be, there's not such thing as a soul being evil or pious or, or raj, raj, rajas. So, what does that mean? Like, because it would seem like there are certainly people who have been in any of those categories. It just means that they've developed that quality of their mind to a great extent. And then once you've developed that quality, you tend to keep doing those kinds of actions, and it takes effort to pull yourself back in the right direction. So it's not, you know, qualitatively the person's soul is not evil. Their mind has become evil. So then it's a choice, right? So it's a choice to be evil. That's right. So if you, when you started your speech, you were talking about three eternal things. You said soul <coughs> and God and the world. Then you started using the word maya. Is the, is the Maya the same as the world? Yes, you can say that just like uh, you can look at a cake and say that's flour because it's made of flour. So, uh, But when you look at it, you say, no, 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 it's not flour, it's a cake because it looks like a cake. So in the same way, this world is actually made of Mayic energy, but we say it's the world when it has a physical form. And then it can actually be dissolved into a subtle form, just an energetic uh, seed form, you can say. And at that time, no physical form exists in the world, but the energy is still there. So, yes, the Maya itself has become this world. So, um, if, if we have a choice, Does that mean that Maya is stronger than our soul? That we can... Good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, see, your soul can't be <clears throat> overpowered by Maya. Think of it like your mind itself is a part of Maya. It's made by Maya and it's a tool for your soul, actually. The soul on its own could exist without a mind and a body, which are those that mind and body are made of Mayak energy. And your soul could exist, but you couldn't experience anything without a mind, senses, body, everything. So it's actually a tool. So our mind is made of Maya, 
Our body is made of maya and the whole world around us is made of maya. And that's one of the reasons the worldly enjoyments are very attractive to our mind because our mind is mayic and the objects of the world are mayic so there's a natural attraction between them. But our decision is always ours. Meaning, you know, what do we want? And what are, what are we going to do to get it? We all want happiness, but some people think all happiness is in uh, just sensual enjoyments. And then they spoil their health by, you know, overindulging in everything. So what causes that? Did Maya overpower the person? No, that was a decision of their mind. In their mind, according to their own understanding, they felt that desire for happiness and their own learning and understanding told them, I can fulfill this desire for happiness by just eating good food or you know any kind of worldly enjoyment. That's a decision of the mind. Nobody made us do it. So that's why, that's where this kind of education comes in, where you have to really think about it. Okay, I want happiness, where is it? The saints say that happiness is in God. So if I start desiring God, my mind will start going in that direction. So I don't know if that really answered your question. So your, your, I want to make sure I understood it. Maya overpowering the soul, in a way, we are under the bondage of Maya because we're bound to be living in this world. None of us can just escape Maya and say, you know, I'm leaving this world behind and I'm going to go and stay in the divine world, which is beyond Maya. We can't just do that. Not in an instant. There's a path that allows us to do that, to overcome Maya. So in a way, yes, our soul is under Maya. But it's not like Maya is uh, making us do anything. We have you know, our own free will, and we can educate ourselves and then turn our mind in whatever direction we want. And then once we become God-realized, your mind becomes divine, so it's no longer mayic, and then you're free from maya. Even if you were to keep living in the world, you wouldn't be bound by maya. You could leave any time you want. You know, the only way that our soul defeats Maya is with God's help. So by surrendering to God, we go beyond Maya. Otherwise, Maya will continue to keep us under bondage. Yes? Is it possible to get rid of Maya? Is it possible to what? To get rid of Maya? Not get rid of completely. Think of Maya, <clears throat> if you think of it, for instance, a jail. There are many prisoners in the jail and someone is released. So now you're no longer bound by that prison. But the prison still exists and there are other people still bound in that prison. That's like when one soul gets released by Maya through God's grace, Maya still exists. We didn't get rid of it. Like we just that, defeated it right. <laughs> through God's grace. So like few people, they defeated and they became free of that jail or whatever. That's right. Is it possible? Because if we don't think about God, every second we make sin. So when I have to eat, to go to school, study, take shower. There are lots of time that I'm not thinking about God. Uh, don't worry about that right now. Just worry about improving. Wherever you are, just try to get better. Try to think of God more and more. That's it. It is possible. It is possible. Yeah. God's not demanding. 
it's not like he's saying, you know, okay, how, how difficult can I make it for these souls? I'm not going to make this cheap, you know. God realization is not going to be cheap. They have to at least work for it. You know, he's making it as easy as possible, actually. But I'll get into that a little bit more in a, in a few minutes. Okay, great. Good. <clears throat> So another question that we could bring up and we could challenge God that, you know, there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason for the good and bad that happens in the world. Are you just doling out suffering and pleasure randomly? How can you justify it? So when we look, you know, from a narrow perspective, from a, uh, the perspective of just what we've seen happen in this life, it doesn't make a lot of sense. We can say, you know, I've been a good person, then why have I suffered so much? I look at my neighbor, my neighbor's not as good as me, and my neighbor's had a better life than I have. Um, you know, I've lost people close to me, or whatever complaint we have, whatever bad things that have happened to us, it doesn't always make sense. Of course, nobody likes to suffer. And if we're suffering, we want to know why we have to suffer. <laughs> so it's quite natural that if someone believes in God's existence or wants to believe in God's existence, they're going to want this question answered. Because we expect God to be just and not just uh, whimsically having some people suffer and others enjoy. So the same Sanskrit scriptures have an answer for this also. The Mahabharat says, Avashyameva bhoktavyam kritam karma shubha shubham. And another saint says, Purvameva kritam karma tadbhagya mitikathyate. That because our soul has lived many, many lifetimes, uncountable lifetimes, well, we've done actions in all of those lifetimes. So it's not only the actions of this life that are being taken into account, but the actions of all of our past lifetimes. And there's a law called, I'm sure you're all familiar with the term karma. So the law of karma is like the law of action and reaction. What we do, we get the result for that. But purva meva, purva means in your previous life, in your past lifetimes. What you did in those past lifetimes is fructifying in this lifetime, meaning it's giving you some kind of result. So you don't get instant results. It means that uh, saying that I've been a good person in this life, so I expect good things to happen to me in this life. We're actually mixing two things up. Being a good person in this life and having good thoughts, that leads to mental peace in this life. It doesn't necessarily lead to any physical reward in this life of any kind of enjoyment. That is determined by our past life's actions. We call that our destiny or our bhagya. What we did in the past, say when a soul is being born in this life, they came from their previous life, now they're going to be born in this next life. At that time, certain things are determined. That this soul is going to experience certain good things and certain bad things in this life because of what they did in their past life. So in fact the good and bad that happens to us in this life is because of what we did in our past lives and the good or bad that we do in this life although it affects our mind immediately but the physical reward or punishment will come in the next life in almost all cases. There are rare exceptions I guess if someone is extremely bad are extremely good there may be some effect some physical effect in this life but for the most part it's all held over until future incarnations 
So this also gives us a framework with which to understand why do things happen. There's no whim involved. There's no randomness. It, you can say it's computerized. It's all kept track of exactly what has every soul done, how, how much good, how much bad, in all of their past lifetimes, and then the results are given gradually over the future lifetimes. Any questions about actions and destiny and how that affects us? There are cycles, like um, I was saying, there's the good energy of Maya and the bad energy, Sattva, Rajtam, so these actually cycle. There are large cycles and there are smaller cycles. And yes, over the course of a day, the Thomas energy tends to be more active at night. That doesn't mean that anything, that if you go out, that it's going to, some personified Thomas energy is going to come and attack you or something. It just means that at that time of night, that energy is more active and it's going to have a, uh, a similar effect on your mind. It's just, it's hard to explain. It's not like it can control your mind, but there's a, a similar vibration. Because we have the Thomas energy in our mind, even if it's dormant to great extent, it's going to be more likely to become active at that time. Um, you know, the morning is more sattvic. It's just the way the Mayak energy cycles. And there are much larger cycles as well. You know, over hundreds of thousands of years, these uh, qualities go up and down. So we're actually in a time right now where the negative energies are more active in general and that lasts for several thousand years and then the good energy becomes more active again. What's the English word for Maya? Uh, you can say cosmic power or material energy. It's the original energy of the universe that scientists are searching for. You know, where did it all come from? What's the original energy, the unified field theory? That's Maya. How you can protect yourself from those energies because you're in the big environment, there's many things going on, and sometimes you can feel those energies, but uh, you just feel it, but there's some vibration I can feel in, inside me, but I cannot control it to plug it in. So how, how can I? The strongest help we can get in that is by attaching our mind to God. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in this whole series, actually. But the more um, deeply your mind is attached to God, the more you're buffered. There's a, like an insulation between you and the energies that surround you. Say that again? The same thing is should, I should send the energy to the that environment, energy of God and love? Uh, you don't need to. See, the way it works is God is everywhere. And anyone can tap into that divine grace who wants to. But no, none of us can make anyone else become open to that energy. We have to open ourselves up to it. And certainly can have some influence through our presence, through our words, and through our own energy. It does influence the people around us, but we can't consciously f make them start receiving that energy. That has to come from them. So I would say um, increase your own attachment to God. Uh, increase your own affinity for God more and more, and you'll naturally affect the people around you in a positive way without trying to. Yes? I, from, from this paradigm, um, you know, like there's these studies that have been done on, you know, like praying over water, and then it has more, you know, like then they pour the water on plants, and the plant that was 
gutting the water that was prayed over it gets healthier than the other plant and that sort of thing. Can you just sort of explain that from your perspective? Like, I would say that's more on an energetic level, a subtle energetic mm -hmm. worldly energy level. It's not that you know our prayer somehow got God to bless that water or, mm -hmm. or bless the plant. There, the positive energy of the universe can be channeled mm -hmm. through a person's will and that's why energy healing works. Okay. And uh, so we do affect and can affect the beings around us and the energies around us in a positive or negative way. Yeah. And we're all connected through that subtle energy, you know, um, that can't be measured by science. There's a, our consciousness is connected with everybody. But uh, what I'm talking about in this series is actually beyond that. It's a way of connecting with a, an even more powerful energy than just the positive energy of the world, but actually God's energy. I have one more question. You know, I, I work with a lot of people where there's a strong invitation to face changing our habits, our patterns, our personality dynamics, and, and it evokes for people a lot of fear mm -hmm. to be presented with that. And, you know, I mean, there's so many sort of theories around that, but... Um, uh, you know, when we're faced with that choice, do I try out this new way of being or, or, or surrendering to some feeling that I'm not used to or that I'm, I'm comfortable with? It seems to me that that precipice is really, when you boil it all down, about faith. That, that our, our level of faith in God, our level of faith in that if I try this out, whatever I feel, whatever I experience for trying this out, has something to do with my level of faith in, a, in my higher power, in God, whatever people's belief is, in, in taking me through that, or, or that, you know, that I'll be safe to... And of course it's all our own mind, because nothing really dangerous is happening in present time. So like it was like what you talked about that day about the per difference between a perceived threat and a real threat. So why is it so powerful for us when we come up to that edge when it's just an emotional thing? Because you're right. I mean, we feel threatened personally and we don't identify with our soul. <clears throat> we identify with the body and with the mind. So, you know, in a way, you can say if our body or our, really, I guess what, what we're afraid of is being embarrassed or, or being vulnerable. So that's a very superficial level of our being, yet that's as far as we generally go. And so we feel our life is being threatened, basically. Even though it's just an emotional thing, we really, it feels like that scary. And it's normal until, you know, again, through proper knowledge and by becoming more, doing more devotion to God, we become, we start to identify more with ourselves as being the soul, it becomes less scary. Great, thank you. But that's, gra that's a gradual process. You can't just intellectualize a fear away. You can control it to some extent, but really your experience has to go beyond that fear. It has to go deeper than that. Then the fear just evaporates. Thank you, that's great. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between soul and spirit? Spirit, I think, is a word that people use in different ways. You know, it can mean a ghost. It can mean, you know, spirit a good spirit, like meaning I'm enthusiastic. It, some people use it for God. They say, you know, the supreme spirit. Or your. some people use it to mean soul. They say your spirit. 
So it really depends on the context. And that's why I don't use that word, because it's so difficult to know what am I referring to if I use the word spirit. So a couple other points regarding destiny that I like to keep in mind. One is that you never really know what's good or bad in the long term. See, we worry about, uh, well, this bad thing is happening to me, and it's so terrible. It's such a bad thing. But we don't know how is that going to play out 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line, that this bad thing ended up leading to many other good things. And secondly, you know, when it comes to trusting God or mistrusting God, even if someone says, you know what, I don't believe in destiny, I believe that God is making this thing happen to me. Okay, so even if you believe that, then you can say, well, God is all-knowing and all-caring and all-kind and all-good. So just like a, a child may think it's a bad thing for my mother to not let me have that candy bar. I wanted it, <laughs> and she snatched it from my hand. So we think that's a bad thing and we cry about it and we feel bad, but the mother is looking out for our best interest, not just looking to fulfill our, you know, moment to moment desires, which could lead us to, you know, if we were allowed to fulfill all of those desires, we might end up in a bad place because of that. So the mother is not worried if we cry a little bit about it. The mother wants us to go in the right direction. So you can look at it like that too, that you know, I need to have I need to have more faith that whatever is happening to me, it's the right thing. I just need to learn how to deal with it. What's in here doesn't have to be affected by what's going on around us. That's again our choice. The destiny, the things that happen to us, they're going to happen. The good and the bad. But our own thinking, that's apart from that. We can decide what to think, how to react to situations. So let's go on to one more thing, which, you know, in my travels, I meet a lot of people who feel really badly when they lose someone close to them, someone that was very dear to them. And, you know, people are not shy to say, I'm angry at God. <laughs> This, this person was so dear to me, why did you take them away from me? But we already have the answers to that because death is part of one's destiny. At the time that you're born, it's already decided. Certain events in your life are pre-decided, pre not all of it. Just some things along the way are pre-decided. One of those things is death. So it means we were given this body as a chance to, uh, you know, have a body that we could use to perform actions and do things. But we were given it for a limited period of time. That's it. And the death of someone's body is not the death of them. They go on and they'll have another life according to, you know, what actions they performed in this life. They'll be given another birth. So there's really, from that perspective, nothing to be angry about. That person was with us for the period of time that they were meant to be with us, and now they've moved on. There are, we have our own lessons to keep learning. We have more time left on this earth before our life ends. That's all it means. Eventually, we'll go on our way too. So. That anger that we feel towards God, it's natural in one sense, but there is a logic behind it. It's not senseless. I think that's what makes people angry when they feel that it's senseless. This person was young. They were my friend. Why should they have been taken away? Well, they weren't taken away from you or, or just to give you pain or just a random act of God. Well, that person was granted this long of a life. It was already 
known at the time they were born that this was going to be the time they were going to leave, and they left. That's it. They, now they went on to their next life.